Hello, I'm Deborah Sims. I'm a CLL patient reporting from ASH for Leukemia Care UK, and I'm with Dr. Tanya Siddiqui from the City of Hope Hospital. Now, Dr. Siddiqui, you did an amazing presentation this morning on your CAR T trial. Will you tell us a bit more about that? Of course, thank you very much. Um, so, I presented on the Juno CAR T cell trial in CLL patients who are multiply relapsed and have very refractory uh, disease. Um, so the Juno CAR T is a um, uh, CAR T cell product that is given in a one-to-one -one ratio for the CD4 and CD8 cells. It just has to be a, do with a different composition than other CAR T cells that are out there in the market. Um, we uh, presented data on 16 patients that have been analyzed thus far, and this is just preliminary data so far. Uh, these 16 patients um, had all failed ibrutinib uh, already. Uh, 13 were progressing on ibrutinib or had been refra or, or were refracted to ibrutinib and three um, actually were intolerant of ibrutinib. Uh, and um, they had high-risk disease in the, for the most part, advanced stage disease for the most part, and they all had to have failed at least two or three different lines of therapy based on, um, you know, their cytogenetics, etc. Um, what we found was among these 16 patients that there were uh, low-grade toxicities. The special toxicities that we look for in CAR T cells is cytokine release syndrome and neurological events. And uh, for cytokine release syndrome, there were uh, maybe 75% events, etc., but majority were low-grade, and there was only one grade 3 uh, event, no grade four events, um, and there were definitely no deaths because of the CAR T cells or uh, any toxicities uh, related to that. Neurological events were about 37% uh, on this trial, and maybe half of them were grade three uh, in severity, but all reversible and manageable. Uh, tumor lysis syndrome was another thing we looked at on this study. There were only two patients who had that, um, and it was all medically managed and reversible um, easily. Um, among the 16 patients uh, that have been analyzed thus far, the best overall response rate was as high as 81% with about 43% complete remission rates. Um, these responses seem to have evolved over time. So at the three month and six month mark, there were more three more patients who either you know, uh, advanced from partial remission to complete remission or stable disease to partial remission. And of course, follow up is ongoing. Um, also very interestingly, uh, there were early undetectable MRD uh, levels on, in majority of these patients, so 71% were undetectable uh, by MRD, by peripheral blood flow at the day 30 first assessment point after CAR T cells. And this uh, response stuck, so even three and six months later in the valuable patients thus far, they have not lost their undetectable MRD status, so they remain in response. Um, we've also checked bone marrow uh, in some patients uh, by next generation sequencing to see if they're MRD uh, undetectable in the bone marrow and we don't have all the data for that yet but seven out of eight at the day 30 mark were undetectable in their bone marrow as well and uh, thus far you know hopefully that's going to continue to um, stick as well um, per se. Yeah. I mean, it was very exciting for me as a patient to see just how far this technology is coming and how quickly it is evolving. How soon before you, I mean obviously more and more trials are opening, you're, you're expanding your trial to add exactly. one in with ibrutinib. Yes. Um, how quickly before you think this is going to be more than a salvage therapy? How, how soon do you think we might see it become more of a second or third line therapy? So that's a very good question. I think we have to first prove that it does do what it's meant to do, which is to produce deep and durable remissions in the refractory or relapse setting first, as with any drug, before we move it earlier in lines of therapies. But I think it'll be fairly quick because we are immediately now in the new year going to go on to uh, enroll the phase two portion, which is more of an expansion, if you will, hopefully get it FDA approved next year if, if they're lucky and if the data sticks and, you know, holds up. Um, there is, like you said, another cohort that has just started accrual, which is combining these CAR, Juno CAR T cells with ibrutinib to see if the responses can be even better uh, and the toxicities as 
tolerable and manageable. Um, so there'll be a 20 patient cohort of that. Uh, hopefully that'll finish next year as well. And subsequent to that, I think new trials are going to come up where we're going to try to say, okay, well, let's not do this in patients who've already failed three lines of therapy, including ibrutinib and other novel agents, but rather let's do it sooner uh, in the second line setting probably uh, before we, um, you know, just to see is, is it going to be even better in that setting because the way I see it, the way I see CAR T-cells, and I do CAR T-cells and lymphomas as well, uh, not just CLL, but if a CAR T-cell works, it works extremely well. And if it's a means to get a patient to not require therapy ever again after responding to a CAR T-cell, then why not try to do it sooner before they have to fail multiple therapies and accumulate toxicities from those multiple therapies. Of course, there are different types of patients. So patients with higher risk disease, I think we should definitely consider um, uh, treating earlier uh, in their line of therapy. Patients with good risk features who can maybe get away a long time with long disease-free, I mean, um, disease-free and treatment-free intervals, then obviously we don't want to rock the boat for that too, too early. So we'll see. Thank Hopefully not too late. <laughs> well, thank you very much no for joining us and uh, congratulations. Thank it was you. a great Appreciate presentation.